Uh, my theme this evening is spiritual ecology, a spirituality that is in harmony with the natural environment. This morning, I attended the parish church in Loch Goyle Head, where we live. I do that now every Sunday morning. Today, the service was conducted by Lorna, a lay worship uh, leader. We celebrated the Harvest Festival, a custom for this time of year. It reminds us that the seasons have been an important element of Christian spirituality alongside the religious calendar. The service opened with these words. For the sweetness of soil from which we come and to which we will return. We give thanks with joy and wonder. For the openness of air which we breathe with all living beings. We give thanks with joy and wonder. For the openness of air which we breathe with all living beings, I'm repeating, <laughs> we give thanks with joy and wonder. For the release of water that falls and streams and refreshes, we give thanks with joy and wonder. For the surprise of fire that kindles and flames is fearsome and wild and sometimes lights up faces with laughter, we give thanks with joy and wonder. May we see in these elements of soil, air, water, and fire, our need, our fulfillment, and our belonging. The arrival of the human species, Homo sapiens, came late in the evolution of our planet. For thousands of years, our ancestors left few impressions on the surface of the earth. Just the other day, I returned to Kilmartin to see evidence of that with the cairns there and the standing stones, which some of you are familiar with. Now, they go back no more than five or 6,000 years. Uh, what little uh, remains of thousands of years of uh, human inhabitation until now. Recent centuries have witnessed such exponential growth in the human population, now approaching 8 billion, that our present age has been called the Anthropocene. To quote one recent report, the past 50 years have seen huge losses and degradation of nature globally. Humans have altered 75% of the planet's land surface, impacted 66% of the ocean area and destroyed 85% of wetlands. Deforestation has accelerated and huge areas of rainforest have been lost to mining, cattle ranching and monoculture plantations. Biodiversity has declined by 70% in the past 50 years. Climate change is destroying huge areas of farmland by prolonged drought and unprecedented flooding. Many societies value nature as an instrument, something to be used just for resources. That perspective has driven the ecological decline of the past half century and beyond. An instrumental valuation that underpins policies and economic structures that in turn shape behavior and social norms also at the individual personal level. Redefining the relationship between people and nature will require redressing this imbalance. Deep changes across societies, economies and communities must now be taken to achieve this shift. How we live in our cities, how we produce food, how and what we learn, and the knowledge and rights that inform our choices. It has been widely recognised that the crisis of our time can be understood as chiefly a spiritual crisis. One climate change advisor to the US government, James Speth, said, I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity, biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse and climate change. 
I thought that 30 years of good science could address these problems. I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, ignorance, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a cultural and a spiritual transformation. Ecological renewal and sustainability necessarily depend upon spiritual awareness and an attitude of responsibility. Spiritual ecologists believe that this includes both the recognition of creation as sacred and behaviors that honor that sacredness. So how did we get here? Uh, what changed the fundamental relationship between the human species and the natural world? What caused the catastrophic disconnection between Western civilization and the non-human world? Some people say that there was a paradigm shift with the so-called age of enlightenment. The separation between humans and nature is considered the philosophical foundation of, of the industrial revolution and the beginning of the unsustainable form of development we call the Anthropocene. In the 17th century, Descartes began to popularize the idea that animals function like unconscious machines. He believed and promoted a vision of life on earth in which animals have no feelings and therefore do not deserve compassion, empathy, or respect. Hence, factory farming. Humans were considered by Descartes to be the center of God's creation, superior to all other forms of life, and with the responsibility to dominate the natural world. This set of beliefs favored a form of industrial progress characterized by dominance over animals, instrumental use and utilitarian abuse of biophysical resources, and the assumption that any form of harm and disruption to the biosphere could be externalized and isolated from human well-being. Such a worldview has been instrumental in the development of colonial Western societies, a worldview largely unquestioned until global limits to industrial and economic growth were identified. The reality of climate change was accepted and the rapid loss of biodiversity gained attention. This historical worldview is the foundation for individual habits, urbanization, and a shared societal idea of continuous progress that is inherently unsustainable and is undermining the possibility for future generations to thrive on Earth. Unless such an assumption is addressed and adjusted to the biological reality of life on Earth, the community of nations will fail to cooperate in the long-term commitment to a global order based on eco-justice and human justice, nature equality and human equality, the recycling and sharing of finite resources and renewable sources of energy. If we assume a separation between humans and nature, then nature only has value when extracted and valued economically with disastrous consequences. Blindness is one of the gospel metaphors for myopic religion and a lack of awareness and conscience. Learning how to look and see what is really there without filters, without prejudice, without preoccupation is to experience truth and wonder and compassionate empathy. So I also experience a call to repentance to change my ways and my priorities, to ask for forgiveness and to be reborn as an earth being. A few years ago at a parliament of the world's religions, I met Vandana Shiva, uh, an amazing uh, Indian woman, uh, uh, a feminist activist, but also a great um, advocate for natural uh, nature-based agriculture, uh, preserving seeds, uh, using 
natural methods. She spoke about a call to overcome the wider and deeper apartheid, an eco-apartheid based on the illusion of separateness of humans from nature. The alienation of much culture and religion from the other than human world is spiritually deadening. We must love whatever is truly life-giving and life-sustaining and hate whatever is destructive and threatening. As the biblical scholar and theologian John Dominic Crossan said recently, we must choose between hell on earth and heaven on earth. Neither exists anywhere else. We cannot separate spiritual ecology from transformative ethics, reality-based economics, justice for all, and peacemaking. Almost 40 years ago, Matthew Fox published his groundbreaking book, Original Blessing, this one. It overturned the original sin fall of man paradigm by restoring the suppressed and neglected mystical and life affirming traditions within medieval Christianity. Thomas Berry, who described himself as not a theologian but a geologian, wrote that original blessing provided a radical cure for all dark and derogatory views of the natural world, a remedy for the deep personal and cultural pathologies that have afflicted our Western tradition and led us to assault the natural world in such a disastrous manner. Words of Thomas Berry. More recently, Matthew Fox founded the Order of the Sacred Air. He wrote, in the voices of earth, air, fire, water, and spirit, the planet cries out for defenders. What it needs is a new order, a community and movement of people from varied backgrounds of belief systems or non-belief systems who share a sacred vow to preserve Mother Earth and to become the best lovers and defenders they can be on behalf of Mother Earth. A post-denominational order and a post-religious order, therefore a spiritual order. It is a movement to gather humanity, to pay attention and to focus on the great issue of our time, which is the survival of our planet in all its diversity, beauty and magnificence. Spirituality is best tested by our generosity and courage and willingness to stand up for generations still unborn by living lives of gratitude and awe, creativity and healing, compassion and justice centered on the sacredness of our common home earth. An order of the sacred earth united in one sacred vow. I promise to be the best lover and defender of the earth that I can be. So for, for Matt Fox, creation spirituality is about recovering nature and all of creation as sacred again. It reaches back to the earliest humans who were struck with the awe of their existence in the midst of the awe of nature. Creation spirituality supports eco-activists and others seeking social, racial, gender and environmental justice. It is a spirituality of passion and compassion, of moral outrage and an unleashing of creativity and hope. Like Matthew Fox, I consider that our spiritual malaise is the result of the great disconnection between most humans and the natural world. We inflict huge destruction and suffering on the non-human world because we live in a profound state of alienation, allied to capitalist economics and rampant consumerism. Spiritual ecology is a means to reconnect with the non-human world and to begin to heal our broken relationship. 
adopting a daily practice of connection, appreciation, appreciation and care is one way. Using the physicality of our senses of sight, hearing, smell, taste and touch. This might start for us with a bird feeder, delighting in the visits of the little birds with their chirps and songs. Or slow walks through the park as the seasons unfold. Or taking time to stop and look, really look, and listen, really listen. And breathing deeply the air you share with all living beings and a gift of oxygen from the trees and plants. All that can be a daily practice. As you say to yourself, I am so glad that I am alive in the world today. Now I want to um, reflect on the wisdom that we can gain from the more than human world. A human-centered consciousness has preoccupied us during the modern era. And that is deeply responsible for the eco-emergency we find ourselves in. Invariably, our human narcissism considers other species as objects to be used by humans and ignores the many spiritual gifts that the more than human world bestows on us. What lessons do animals teach us about spirituality? Uh, consider what the book of Job has to say in chapter 12. Ask the animals and they will teach you. Ask the birds of the air and they will tell you. Ask the fish of the sea and they will declare to you. Who among you does not know that the hand of God has done all this? In God's hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of every human being. Job sees all of creation as a giant classroom of life and wisdom. Animals, birds, plants and fish all have something to teach us humans. Think if you have a, a, a pet, think of your cat or your dog as starters. Jesus was very much a person of the earth and a keen observer of animals. Birds and animals, sheep and goats, an ox needing help on the Sabbath, and wolves, doves, sparrows, snakes and fish show up in his teachings. The mystics Meister Eckhart says that every creature is a word of God and a book about God. God loves all creatures equally and fills them with his being. We should lovingly meet all creatures in the same way. During the past week, Dorothy and I spent some time further up the, the coast of Argyle and, a, among other things, visited the small island of Luing, which is just beyond um, a seal island off the coast. And uh, they're on the island of Luing, which is famous for its slate quarries. Um, we, we, we met uh, someone called Norman Bissell, who's a writer. He, he's a former history teacher, but for a long time now, he has been a writer who moved from Lanarkshire and Glasgow to Luing. Um, He's apparently written a novel based on the last years of George Orwell on the island of Jura, and he's also written books of poetry. And I want to just read one short poem to you, and it's about an encounter with the other than human world. It's called A Stoat One Morning. On the way to the pillar one morning, I came across two stoats cavorting on the road above a crumbling stone wall. The smooth tan and white coat and bright sharp face of one staring at me, alert, inquisitive. Nothing special, she decided, and unhurried, disappeared under green bracken. Only then did I feel gentle spits of rain fall on me and the road, and spot swallows skydiving above the hill. In that moment, the stoat, the rain, the swallows, and I were one.
Where Dorothy and I live in Argyll, we are connected to the sea by Loch Goyle and Loch Long. Re recently, we paddled our kayaks three miles down the loch to visit a large colony of grey seals at a sheltered cove. We approached gently so as not to disturb them. We sat quietly off the shore, watching them as they watched us. Some of the seals were swimming in the water around us. When we headed for home, there was a bonus, the sight of a porpoise rising and diving into the loch. We passed a cormorant sitting on a buoy with wings outstretched to dry. Nearer the shore, we saw below the surface of the water the abundant green seaweed waving about. These moments of connection are precious to us. It's allowing ourselves really to feel it, to feel that connection, to be part of that larger world. In the garden, there are bird feeders, both front and back of the house, with different birds visiting each. At the back, there are lots of little chaffinches and siskins. At the front, we have sparrows and goldfinches and robins. Dorothy puts out food for a hedgehog's nightly visit. Sometimes, although not recently, we, we see a red squirrel. I confess that I used to kill slugs and snails, but now I collect them carefully and relocate them to a nearby field. Likewise, any creatures found in the house, spiders, beetles, woodlice, are gently collected and released out of doors. Flying insects are coaxed to an open door or window. I think all of this is part of a spiritual ecology practice. Spiritual ecologists acknowledge all beings as inherently sacred, recognize the spiritual dimension of the ecological crisis, actively nurture relationships with non-human beings. Spiritual ecologists have core values that begin with recipro reciprocity, service, reverence, but which also include interconnectedness, kinship, humility, and compassion. Social ecologists honor and protect the natural living world. Spiritual ecologists express wonder and gratitude and compassion. To understand that the natural world is comprised of living beings, our fellow living beings. To feel how the natural world is inseparable from us and us from that natural world. To inform our spirituality and I say, perhaps we need that spiritual transformation before there will be a real change, a needed change in our world today. <laughs>